Isn't it a great day to be a Christian? Thankful for your presence this morning. Uh, happy Christmas Eve. This time throughout the world, people are thinking about the little babe in a manger. Uh, <coughs> the babe in the manger is the most popular view of Jesus because the little babe in the manger uh, doesn't issue any commands, doesn't uh, require any repentance. He doesn't make any judgment. He doesn't create any controversy. In fact, the babe in the manger is the perspective of, of people, the perspective of Jesus that many people have because when they rip that out of context, they ignore a lot of other things about Jesus. Uh, the, some of the things that are forgotten about Jesus during this time of year are like his example. Turn to 1 Peter chapter 2. 1 Peter chapter 2. Let's start reading in verse 21. Peter writes this, For even hereunto were ye called, because Christ also suffered for us, leaving us an example, that ye should follow in his steps, who did no sin, neither was guile found in his mouth, who, when he was reviled, reviled not again, when he suffered, he threatened not, but committed himself to him that judgeth righteously. Uh, People think about the babe in the manger. They set the nativity scene up on the mantle. They sing, O little town of Bethlehem and silent night. But they don't want to follow the example that Jesus set. They don't want to do the things that he said that they needed to do. They don't let Jesus change the way they think or the way they talk or the way they act or how they live their daily lives. When we focus on the babe in the manger, sometimes we forget about the authority of Jesus. Look at Matthew chapter 28. Matthew chapter 28, verse 18. It says this, And Jesus came and spake unto them, saying, All power is given unto me in heaven and in earth. We love that little babe in the manger. We love little baby Jesus, but we forget that he's been given all authority. We forget that Jesus is supposed to be Lord of our lives. We're supposed to be doing what he said to do. But perhaps the most forgotten or most ignored thing about the baby in the manger is that just like he came the first time, he's coming back again. Appreciate Brother Johnny for singing, there's a great day coming and one day he's coming back. We need to remember that. Uh, and that's what our text is dealing with this morning. So look at 2 Peter chapter 3. 2 Peter chapter 3. Sadly, millions of people that are honoring the little babe in the manger today and tomorrow may not be nearly as excited when he comes back again in judgment. 2 Peter 3, beginning in verse 8, says this, But beloved, be not ignorant of this one thing, that one day is with the Lord as a thousand years, and a thousand years as one day. The Lord's not slack concerning his promise, as some men count slackness, but his long-suffering to usward, not willing that any should perish, but that all should come to repentance. But the day of the Lord will come as a thief in the night, in the which the heavens shall pass away with a great noise. The elements shall melt with fervent heat, the earth also, and the works that are therein shall be burned up. One of my favorite things about living in the South is the way people talk. Uh, there are Southern expressions that we understand that some people in other places in the country might not have any idea what we're talking about. I mean, people in other places might say that somebody's rich or they're wealthy. Down here we'll say they're eating high on the hog or they're living in high cotton. Uh, other people might say something like, oh, he really got angry, but we'd say, oh, he was madder than an old wet hen. Okay, there are things that we say that they don't say. Some people might say you're hypocritical. If you do things that you criticize other people for, around here we'll say that's just the pot calling the kettle black. I think my favorite Southern expression is bless your heart because it can be used for so many things. It can go all the way for, I'm so sorry you're hurt. Bless your heart. <laughs> to thank you for bringing me that big glass of sweet tea. Bless your heart. To how can somebody as dumb as you get dressed by themselves all in the morning, every morning, bless your heart. I mean, it's a catch all expression. And we have all kinds of ways of saying that something's taking a long time. When we're in a meeting that seems like it's going to last forever, we say we're going to be here till the cows come home. 
Or if somebody's being slow, we might say they're moving like molasses in January. But if you want to say something to a kid and get them to understand something being slow, you say they're slow as Christmas. Because for a kid, it seems like Christmas is not ever going to get here. I remember when I was a kid, we were anxious for Christmas. We started thinking about it weeks and months ahead of time. And we anticipated that arrival and we couldn't wait for school to let out. And then when school was out, we couldn't wait for Christmas because we knew that good things were going to come. Now, we didn't know exactly what they would be. We might not know every detail. We might not know what the presents under the tree were going to be. But we knew there was something to look forward to. And we might not know what we were going to eat, but we knew that the food was going to be really, really good at this time of year. Uh, we knew that Christmas was a special time for getting together with family and friends. Well, Christmas is here. This is Christmas Eve. Tomorrow's Christmas Day. And I pray that you and your family are going to have a blessed time of making memories. But this morning, I want us to look at another day, a day that's even slower than Christmas. Slower than Christmas. It's probably the day that's most anticipated, talked about, feared, dreaded, doubted, scoffed at in all the history of mankind. And we're talking about the judgment day, the coming of Christ, the day of the Lord. And people said in our scripture reading this morning that he is coming back. And the day of the Lord may be slower than Christmas. And like, unlike the rest of the world, they may be dreading that Christians should be looking forward to it. But we need to understand that there's a reason that we need to thank God that the judgment day hadn't been here already. Let's look at our text, 2 Peter 3, 8 and 10. But go up to the beginning of the chapter, 2 Peter chapter 3, verse 1. Peter says, This second epistle, beloved, I now write unto you, in both which I stir up your pure minds by way of remembrance, that ye may be mindful of the words which were spoken before by the holy prophets and of the commandment of us, the apostles of the Lord and Savior, knowing this first, that there shall come in the last days scoffers walking after their own lust and saying, where is the promise of his coming? For since the fathers fell asleep, all things continue as they were from the beginning of the creation. For this they willingly are ignorant of, that by the word of God the heavens were of old, the earth standing out of the water and in the water, whereby the world that then was being overflowed with water perished, but the heavens and the earth, which are now by the same word, are kept in store, reserved unto fire against the day of judgment and perdition of ungodly men. They were saying, well, if the world's going to end, why hadn't it ended already? Why do they keep saying this? And then he wrote what's in our text, verse 8, But, beloved, be not ignorant of this one thing, one day, is with the Lord as a thousand years, a thousand years as one day. The Lord is not slack concerning his promise, as some men count slackness, but is long-suffering to usward, not willing that any should perish, but that all should come to repentance. That's what we want to focus on this morning, God's long-suffering, his patience. Every day that we wake up is just another example that God is a patient God. Think about this. Peter wrote this passage about 30 years after Christ uh, went back to heaven, after he told his people that he was going to come back again. It had only been 30 years and people were already making fun of it. They were already scoffing. They were already saying, where is Jesus if he's going to come back? Why hadn't it happened already? And here we are nearly 2,000 years later and there's still more people making fun, scoffing, ridiculing us. Uh, but we need to take comfort in God's promise and in God's patience and the fact that it's still intact. He hadn't lost his patience with us yet. God's will is letting us get more things done that we need to be getting done. Uh, God's patience is evident all through Scripture. Look in the Psalms. Psalm 145, verse 8 says, The Lord is gracious and full of compassion, slow to anger, and of great mercy. The Lord is good to all, and his tender mercies are over all his works. See, it's because Christ's second coming is slower than Christmas that we have more time to do what he tells us we need to do. This morning, I want us to look at three things that we need to do before the Lord comes back. Three reasons why we need to think, be thankful that the day of the Lord is slower than Christmas. Number one, we need to be reconciled to God. Let's look at Paul as an example. 
we first meet Paul in Scripture, he's called Saul. Look at uh, Acts chapter 8. Acts chapter 8. Acts chapter 7, Peter has just preached a great gospel sermon, and he made his audience mad. They didn't want to hear about it. In fact, they got so mad that they stoned him. And uh, as Acts 8 begins, Saul is there with him. Look at Acts chapter 8, beginning in verse 1. It said, And Saul was consenting unto his death, and at that time there was a great persecution against the church, which was at Jerusalem, and they were all scattered abroad throughout the regions of Judea and Samaria, except the apostles. And devout men carried Stephen to his burial and made great lamentation over him. Look at verse 3. As for Saul, he made havoc of the church, entering into every house and hailing men and women, committed them to prison. Saul, even though he thought he was doing what was right, was working against God. Think about it. If the day of the Lord had come then, Saul would have been lost for all eternity. Saul would have been in sin if the Lord had come back then, but thanks be to God, he was spared. Because of that, he was able to write more than half of our New Testament. Saul was determined to destroy the church. Go over to chapter 9. Look at the beginning of that chapter. Verse 1 says, And Saul, yet breathing out threatenings and slaughter against the disciples of the Lord, went unto the high priest and desired of him letters to Damascus, to the synagogues, that if he found any of this way, whether they were men or women, he might bring them bound into Jerusalem. But we know that Saul wasn't allowed to complete his mission. He thought he was going to do that. He started off, but on his way to Damascus, he saw this bright light. He was struck down, and he heard the voice of Jesus. And he said, Saul, why are you persecuting me? And Saul said, Jesus, what do I need to do? And Jesus told him to go to Damascus, and there he'd be told what he needed to do. And then the Lord went to a Christian named Ananias and told him that he needed to go see Saul. He needed to go talk to him. But Paul's reputation had preceded him to Damascus, and Ananias knew who Saul was. Well, let's look how he responded to the Lord's request. Acts 9, beginning in verse 13. Then Ananias answered, Lord, I've heard by many of this man how much evil he hath done to thy saints at Jerusalem, and here he hath authority from the chief priest to bind all that call on thy name. Have you ever done that? Have you ever read a passage of Scripture and say, oh, this is what I need to do, but Lord, surely you understand that, that, that I can't do that. And surely you understand there are reasons why I don't do what you told me to do. The Lord told Ananias to go to Saul. Saul says, but Lord, you just don't understand. You don't know what kind of man this is. But God did understand. Look at verse 15. But the Lord said unto him, Go thy way, for he is a chosen vessel unto me to bear my name before the Gentiles and kings and the children of Israel. For I will show him how great things he must suffer for my name's sake. God was telling Ananias, no, you don't understand. I've got a purpose for Paul. I've got a purpose for Saul, and you're part of my plan. You need to do what I told you to do. Well, how did Ananias respond then? Look at verse 17. And Ananias went on his way and entered into the house, and putting his hands on him, said, Brother Saul, the Lord, even Jesus, that appeared unto thee in the way as thou camest, hath sent me that thou mightest receive thy sight and be filled with the Holy Ghost, and immediately there fell from his eyes as it had been scales, and he received sight forthwith and arose and was baptized. Saul was working against God. Saul was working against the kingdom of the Lord, and he had to be reconciled with God. Jesus had plans for Saul to be a, an ambassador to the Gentiles and to the Jews, and he would go on and be used as a useful instrument in fact, he reached many people. He's reaching us today with his letters that have been preserved in Scripture. God's patience allowed Saul to become reconciled to him. No matter what life you're living, God's patience has given you time to be reconciled to him, to repent, to confess, to take Jesus on as Lord, to repent of your sins, be baptized, to have your sins washed away. Every day that God gives us is another day. And once you've already obeyed the gospel, once you're part of his kingdom, he gives us another opportunity to be better, to do things better than we've been doing. Whatever our struggle is, God is patient. We might not be like Paul, deliberately working against the Lord, but we're doing everything we can to work with him, to do his will. 
We're studying Philippians in our Wednesday night Bible class. Go to Philippians chapter 3. We looked at this passage last Wednesday night. Philippians 3, beginning in verse 12. The Apostle Paul is writing, the same apostle that the Lord met on the way to Damascus, the same one that had his sins washed away uh, by Ananias in baptism. Philippians 3, beginning in verse 12, Paul says, Not as though I had already attained, either were already perfect, but I follow after, if that I may apprehend that for which also I am apprehended of Christ Jesus. Brethren, I count not myself to have apprehended, but this one thing I do, Forgetting those things which are behind and reaching forth unto those things which are before, I press towards the mark for the prize of the high calling of God in Christ Jesus. Paul said, I haven't made it yet, but I'm trying to get better. I'm trying to get closer. I'm trying to get more like Jesus. Whatever's behind us, whatever we've done, God's delaying the second coming of Christ has given us an opportunity to be reconciled with him. Second thing that God's patience allows us to do is to spend our time doing good works. Go to Ephesians chapter 2. Ephesians chapter 2, and let's start reading in verse 8. Paul writes this, For by grace are ye saved through faith, and that not of yourselves, it's the gift of God, not of works, lest any man should boast. For we are his workmanship, created in Christ Jesus unto good works which God hath before ordained that we should walk in them, good works. They won't save us. We can't do good enough to be good enough. We can't ever do enough to have done enough. But that's what we were created in Christ to do. We were created to do good works. We're his workmanship. We're the hands of the Lord. God's ordained that as the church and as individual Christians, we're supposed to be doing good things. And each day that the Lord delays his coming, Gives us another day to do good works. This congregation is engaged in doing good works. We uh, help provide shoes for the needy school children. We send pantry items to the orphans' home to help feed them. We help men that are trying to, to go preach in India by promoting their school there, providing for Brother Kumar and his work. We help support the families of the Bibles, the preaching students in Memphis. What about as individuals? What am I doing that's good? What are you doing? That's good. Look at Titus chapter 3. <laughs> Titus chapter 3, verse 8 says, This is a faithful saying, and these things I will that thou affirm constantly, that they which have believed in God might be careful to maintain good works. <coughs> these things are good and profitable unto men. If we're Christians, if we're part of God's family, we need to be careful to be doing good works. Paul told Titus that the Christians should be careful to do good works, uh, Jesus told us why. Go to Matthew chapter 5. Matthew chapter 5, verse 14. Jesus says, Ye are the light of the world. A city that is set on a hill cannot be hid. Neither do men light a candle and put it under a bushel, but on a candlestick, and it giveth light to all that are in the house. Let your light so shine before men that they may see your good works and glorify your Father which is in heaven. We're supposed to do good works. Why? So that God is glorified, so that he's praised. Uh, because of that, we're told that we're supposed to good work, do good works. And there's a warning that we've got to heed because of our good works. Look at Matthew chapter 23. See, there's some people that do good works, but they're not doing them for the right reason. Matthew 23, beginning in verse 2, Jesus is talking. He says, saying, the scribes and the Pharisees sit in Moses' seat. All therefore, whatsoever they bid you observe, that observe and do but do not ye after their works, for they say and do not. For they bind heavy burdens and grievous to be borne and lay them on men's shoulders, but they themselves will not move them with one of their fingers, but all their works they do for to be seen of men. As Christians, we're supposed to be doing good works. We're supposed to be doing them for the right reason. We're supposed to be doing them to bring glory and honor to the Lord and not so that people can see what we're doing whole purpose of good works is not for us. In fact, it's not even for the people that we're helping. The reason that we're supposed to be doing good works is to attract more people to Jesus. And God's long-suffering, <laughs> his patience with us, his delaying the second coming of Christ gives us more opportunities to, good work, to do good works. I can't imagine how many days I've wasted that I should have been doing something good. Uh, and still God says, here's another day. 
Take another chance. Here, you didn't do it yesterday. Maybe you'll do it tomorrow. And the Lord didn't come back. And I've wasted days and days. How many more days am I going to get? How many more opportunities are we going to have to do good works? We need to thank God that the second coming of Christ is slower than Christmas. We need to be thankful that he's patient and he's giving us more opportunities to do what he wants us to do. Finally, point number three, every day that the Lord delays in coming gives us one more opportunity to persuade other people to obey the gospel. Every day that isn't judgment day is another day that somebody else can hear about the saving grace of Jesus. It's another day for somebody <coughs> to find the truth about God's word. Uh, it's another day for somebody to have their sins washed away. Another day for somebody to bring their life in accordance with God will, God's will. And you may know somebody that needs to hear that. I don't know who it is. Maybe it's your, your uncle or your aunt or your cousin or your neighbor or the checker at Walmart, your husband, your wife. I don't know. But you probably know people that need to know about God. And every day that the Lord delays in coming back, we have another opportunity to tell them about Jesus. We have another opportunity to tell them about God's will for their lives and the life-saving gospel. Paul took every opportunity he had to persuade people to come to know Jesus. Uh, the day of the Lord's coming, and we need to make the most of the time we have between now and whenever that is. I don't know about you, but the older I get, the faster time seems to go by. Well, it seems like it was just Christmas just a little while ago. Well, lots of things have happened in the last year since last Christmas. I don't know about you, I've got a little app on my phone. You may have, there's several of them that pop up and say, here are things that, memories that you've made. And you look back at what happened a year ago or five years ago. And I say, that was five years ago? Wow, that went by in a hurry. Just the other day, I got a, a picture of a volleyball team that I coached when they were in seventh grade. And I thought, oh, I remember those girls. That was a lot of fun. And I got to thinking about it. And all of them are married. All those seventh grade little girls are... Two of them have babies that they're expecting this year. Uh, time is going by fast. For me, Christmas isn't slow anymore. And that gets us to our last scripture this morning. Look at Hebrews chapter 10. Hebrews chapter 10, verse 24. Hebrew writer says this, Let us consider one another to provoke unto love and to good works, not forsaking the assembling of ourselves together as the manner of some is, but exhorting one another. And so much the more as you see the day approaching. We look at that scripture a lot as a scripture that says we shouldn't forsake the assembly. We shouldn't uh, find other things more important than gathering with the Lord's people. That's important. But this morning, I want us to look at why. Why are we here today? Well, we're here to encourage one another because we know that that day is approaching. The Lord's coming back again. We don't know when. We don't know how much longer we're going to have, but it's closer now than it was yesterday. Uh, let's make the most of this time that God's given us. Today and tomorrow, people are focused on that babe in the manger. They're focused on the Lord. They're focused on Jesus. Let's thank God that he sent Jesus. And let's recognize that we need to understand his example. We need to apply it to our lives. We need to understand his authority. We need to make him Lord of our lives. We need to understand that he's coming back. Before he does, you need to be reconciled with God. You need to be a Christian. It's the only life worth living, the only death one would dare to die. The day of the Lord's approaching. If you're already a Christian, then you need to be using every day between now and then to, to be doing good works. We need to use every chance we have to tell somebody else about Jesus and persuade them to obey the gospel. God's been waiting patiently for 2,000 years for some people to make that decision we don't know when the day of the Lord's going to be. We learn from the New Testament how to be saved. We need to hear the word of God. Believe that Jesus is his son. Confess him as Lord of our lives. Repent of our sins. And have them washed away in the waters of baptism. Once we're added to the Lord's body, he expects us to be doing good works. To be telling other people about Jesus. If you're subject to the Lord's invitation this morning, won't you come right now? So we stand together as we sing.